Hi, welcome back. In my last videos, I went over the code for testing the practice form page. In this video, I will show you a similar test case that is data-driven. Implementing data-driven test cases makes it quick and easy to increase test coverage by simply adding more data to a data source. I will go over the changes I made to the test case in order to make it data-driven, and then execute the test, review the results, and after all that, I will deep dive into the code. A data-driven test case is a test case that repeats all or most of the same test steps, but with different sets of data for each iteration. Data could be the text to type into a text field, which radio button to select, or even what values to verify. In the test case that I will demo in this video, each iteration will open a browser, navigate to this page, and then execute actions to the web elements. Let me show you the data used for this test case. I have the test data stored in the MySQL database in a table named after the test case. Each record is used for one iteration of the test case. I have a field in the database table named after each web element in the practice forms page. Here's the first one, the first name field. You can see that the first record will type the text peter underscore one underscore ef into the first name field. An empty value, as well as a null value, means that no action will happen to the web element. But if the string null, as shown here, is used, then my code will clear out the text in a web text field. For these three radio buttons, the code will select whichever one has a select value. The same thing will happen for checkboxes. In addition, unselect can also be used. One more thing to note is that in my test data, I included information to help me debug and test my code so I can see the information while it is actually running. This will also help you to see what is being tested when I do the demo. For instance, the numbers in the test data let us know which row in the data table is being executed. And the suffix EF lets us know that this test should fail because my code will be trying to enter text into the email underscore fail web element, which does not exist. The web element email does exist in the web page, but it is not the same as email underscore fail, which is an object I created for my code so I can test to make sure my code works properly when the object does not display on the web page. Now I will go over the code that makes the test case data driven. I created a method that returns all the records from the MySQL database table that this test case uses. It returns the rows and columns of data as a two-dimensional list of objects. I will deep dive into this method's code after executing the test case. Next, I use the data provider annotation. It's part of the data-driven feature in Selenium's TestNG framework. The name attribute of the data provider is set here. I like to keep it simple and name it the same as the method that returns the test data, even though it does not need to be named the same. This line is required to be placed directly above the method. Placing it directly above the test method tells this data provider that the data returned from this method is the data that is to be provided to the test case. But how does the test case know which data provider to use? In the test annotation, I reference the data provider as such. This tells the test case located directly below this line to use the data from that data provider. For each field in the data object, I declare a variable that will automatically hold its value. These variables are passed in as arguments into the test case method. They need to be placed in the same order here as they are listed in the data object. I made sure the data object order matches the order in the data table. All that is left to do now is to replace the hard-coded data in the test case method with these variables. And that's it. There's no need to write any code to loop the test case code or anything special to handle continuing to the next iteration if an error occurs. Now let's run the test case. When the test runs for each iteration, look at the text typed into the first name text field and see if you can figure out if that iteration will do actions to the web elements found below the email text field. The first iteration just started. Now the second iteration started.
This is the last iteration, number five. I can tell by looking at the first name text field. The test run finished. The last part of the log shows just the steps that you would see in the QA portal, and none of the additional log information. The additional information is just there for the automation engineer. As mentioned in previous videos, an HTML version is always generated too. Let me show you what was generated for this run. These reports automatically get generated where I have my QA web portal code stored. Here's the HTML report for just the failed steps of all the test cases from this run, ID 1565. And here are the full HTML reports for each iteration. Let me go back to the log report. When you scroll up, you can see the same steps for each iteration. Here's iteration 5. And here's iteration 4. Let's go back to the end of the log so we can look at all the iterations grouped together. Here are all the steps for every iteration. This is where the reporting starts for run ID 1565. You can see where each iteration starts by looking for step number one. You might be wondering, why are there more steps for the last two iterations? Main reason is because the first three iterations failed trying to enter text into a text field that does not exist, which is the email underscore fail text field. So the execution exited out of the test case early. I also knew these iterations would fail by looking at the text typed into the first name text field. The iterations with the text suffix of EF are the ones expected to fail. EF standing for email underscore failure. It is critical to always test your code thoroughly before using it for real QA testing because you want to make sure accurate results are reported to the IT team. Using test data to indicate the test results makes it easier to keep track of what was and was not tested. There are many more ways to test your code before using it to test your application, and I will go over them in a future video. For now, I want to concentrate on showing you my coding style. Another failure was reported. When I wrote the code, I was not expecting this failure at all. It's stating that for the subject text field, the expected text did not match the actual. The actual was blank. Notice that I used single quotes around both the actual and expected text, so we know exactly what was compared. You'd be surprised how often leading and trailing spaces have caused automation issues that were hard to troubleshoot. Best to ask the person who provided you the requirements if trailing spaces are allowed in the application. If so, you would then add code to trim spaces before doing the evaluation. When you do real testing, you always want to retest failed test cases manually before reporting them to the dev team. Let's see what happens when I do this step manually. I will type into the subject text field. So far, so good. Now watch what happens to the text field when I select one of the checkboxes. It clears out, so this is an actual bug. Here are the test results again. If you want to review the report some more on your own, please pause here and continue when you are ready. Now I will do a deep dive into the code. This will cover the code that will return the test data from the MySQL data table. Here again is the method that the data provider calls to retrieve data. And that method calls the getMySQLData method. And the name of the MySQL table containing the test case data is passed in here. I named the tables the same as the test case names. Now, let me show you where the getMySQLData method is defined. On the left is the same code in the same file we were just looking at. The getMySQLData method is defined in the class file named dataProviderMySQL, shown on the right. I will summarize what this method does. First, it connects to the MySQL database. Then it executes a prepared statement in order to retrieve all the data from the table and assigns it to a result set. The code then gets the column and row count from the result set. Then it loops through each row of records found in the result set. For each row iteration, it does another loop that iterates through each column in order to get the test data for each web element. These two loops increment an outer and inner loop counter variable used to append the values to a two-dimensional data object that will represent the database table. And finally, the method returns the data object back to this method. 
By placing the at data provider annotation directly above this method, it allows the data provider to retrieve the return data. As setting the data provider name in the test annotation, this instructs the test case method to use that data. So it can pass them in as arguments for each field and to repeat the test case for each record. The data provider feature was used here to retrieve data from a MySQL database, but it can also be used to retrieve data from an Excel or CSV file. I created such code and I will briefly go over the code at a basic level. This is the test case method. It reports the data in an Excel file that has the first name and last name columns. Get test data Excel is the method that the data provider uses. It calls the get Excel data method that has two parameters. One is the Excel file name and the other is the sheet name. Normally, I would name the Excel file the same as the test case name, but I borrowed this from another test case I already had created. The get Excel data method is defined in the data provider Excel class shown here. I created Excel methods for get column count, get row count, and get cell data, and I placed them in a class I named utilities Excel. Then, just like for the database table code, I have it looping through the Excel table so that it can append the cell data to an object. Running the test case generated this log. This log came from get Excel data method. This came from the test case method. This was auto generated based on the test case signature arguments and the test results. You should now be able to see how this Excel data provider code can be applied to a web page test case, in the same way how I explained the MySQL database data was used. This concludes the video on data driven testing. If you have any questions, please send them to my email address that can be found in the description below, and I will make sure to reply back. You can also find there a link to the next video to watch. Thank you for watching.